So Mason would kind of be that ambassador for guys that were trying out for the team. And they just wanted to hang out with someone, you know, what better person than Mace who's from New York anyway, could kind of show you the ropes. So Mace was, you know, the way I've described it to people is like Mace would, if you've ever seen training day where Denzel takes Ethan Hawk out for those 24 hours and like Ethan Hawk is like scared shitless because it's like, you know, he's taking him to, you know, bust these drug deals and he's taking him to go, you know, uh, to a card game. And then these guys are threatening to shoot Ethan Hawk. Like, all that wild shit was kind of like Mace would bring these training camp invites along with him for like these ride alongs, basically (laughs) where they didn't know what they were getting into. And one of my favorite interviews for the whole book was this guy named Gary Waits who uh, played at Alabama. You know, he's in training camp with the Knicks and he agrees to go out with Mace, but then, you know, it's like after a day of practice, they go out, you know, early in the evening, they go out and they, they go and kind of just drink gin on the you know on the stairs of a place in queens where mace hangs with his boys so they're just drinking gin outside a couple hours smoking probably i'm sure Mm. but then you know mace is like all right time for the next stop so they go pick up this beautiful woman that mace is seeing and he's like okay cool maybe we'll go home now so i could go to bed and get ready for practice it starts at (laughs) eight in the morning under pat riley but no mace calls up his boy who owns a restaurant who's willing to open it after hours. So it's like they make uh, Gary Waits the awkward third wheel. Um, you know, he, Mace, and the woman sit there and have dinner at like the seafood spot that is open, you know, because his boy opened it to like 3, 3.30. Then they finally go home. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, the, the guy is just dead tired. Gary Waits is dead tired because they got practice in a couple hours. And he tells me that he can barely walk straight. He's so tired. But then he looks up at Mason. He's like winning the drills, um, you know, and winning, winning all the sprints and everything. And he's like, what the hell? Like, how is this guy <laughs> the way he is? But that sort of stuff and the stuff in college where his roommates didn't want to room with him anymore mm. because Mace was weird and lighting matches on fire and then flicking them <laughs> at his roommates one, two days into college starting like that stuff. You know, I talked to the people that had their first drinks with Mason Um you know, I have a story of how Mason lied to the woman that he would eventually get engaged to about how he worked at McDonald's and was a fry cook uh, <laughs> because he wanted to make sure that uh, he wanted to make sure that like whoever was going to be with him was with him for him and not because he was a basketball star. So, mm. you know, that story and, you know, the story of how he proposed to her right after the NBA finals rolls up at three in the morning uh, with this music blaring coming down a street in Queens and basically wakes up the whole neighborhood. And he calls his girlfriend on her cell phone and asks her to come downstairs. And he pulls out this big six carat gleaming ring, but does it with like the music blaring basically. And it's just like only Mace, but it it, it fits him. And uh, I wanted the story I was telling about him to fit him, that he's a romantic in a really weird way, but like in a kind of underhanded, (laughs) I have to lie to you before I can love you sort of way. Um, you know, the fact that he was always cussing at his coaches to explain to you, you know, from the chapter before how he gets into it with Riley so often and gets suspended by Riley twice. Yeah. Well, he always had issues with his coaches. And then I think it's a chapter or two later after that, that I, I lay out the death threat that he wrote out to Don Nelson and everything else. I mean, mm. Mason was wild, <laughs> but he also was human and he also was real and he also was loving and also was prayerful. Um, And I felt like getting to all that stuff was so important because I did not want someone, my fear, both the thing that helps me with this book process and selling the book, but also my fear is the blogs and the the podcast appearances and the fact Mm. that you know that people are going to aggregate the really crazy stuff that's in the book. Mm -hmm. You know that. The last thing I want for Anthony Mason's family, which they've already been through so much, the last thing you want is for stuff to just get aggregated like crazy and it's just making the dude out to be a complete lunatic yeah, yeah. that wasn't even a human, uh, that, that like was barely human because all we're talking about is the sexual exploits. And there's plenty of that in the book. It's not to say that it's not there. I wasn't shying away from anything, mm-hmm. but I also need you to understand this was a this was a human who played basketball, who had flaws like anybody, but also had good qualities. And um, so I was really proud that when my agent and when my book editor and when my friends read this chapter. They're like, 
I don't know whether to love or hate the guy, but man, this is a really complete picture of who he must have been. No, no doubt and about it. I got a text message yesterday from one of his best friends, uh, who is mentioned in the chapters, quoted in the chapter. He was like, I loved this book, but the chapter I'm he's like, Thank you mm. for making us feel better about the fact that we trusted you enough to do this and to write this chapter on our friend, because that's exact. I felt like I could hear Mason saying some of the stuff in that chapter. Mm. And that makes me, I mean, I've gotten compliments from Spike Lee from, you know, I know the commissioner of the league has been reading the book over the last few days. Mm. Um, You know, I've seen pictures of people reading the book on the train. All of it is a super, you know, compliment. It just a huge compliment and so humbling to know all that. But to hear from Mason's people and to say, look, we get that you had some, you had a job to do. You're a journalist. You're digging. Of course, you've got to include what you've got to include. But to know that they feel like I did right by the person that I was writing about and someone that they love that they're never going to get back, that means a lot to me personally. And uh, it, it means that I th- that it was work well done as far as no uh, making sure that I wasn't just trying to make the guy look like a, a, a crazed person without context. Yeah, n- no question, man. It, it was skillfully done. I, I got to hand it to you. That was definitely you. by far uh, one of my favorite chapters in the book because uh, I, I was a big Mason fan. 